Good evening and welcome to NTD News. I'm Stephanie Cox. Here are today's top stories. While jurors deliberate their verdict, written House attorneys request that the case be thrown out. Is it likely to happen? An attorney gives us his take. The House votes to censure Republican Congressman Paul Gosar and strip him of his committee assignments. It was largely along party lines, with two Republicans joining the Democrats. A temporary hold is put on President Biden's vaccine mandate for larger private employers after a slew of lawsuits. A Florida congressman responds. Senator Josh Hawley introduces a parent's bill of rights. He says it's time to give control back to parents. This as parents nationwide demand greater transparency from their schools. Can frozen turkeys fly? They can and they have. We bring you tips on how to travel with food and zip through the airport with a breeze. But be prepared, this holiday travel season is shaping up to be all but pandemonium. The jury is still deliberating their verdict for Kyle Rittenhouse. There is now talk about the judge possibly throwing the case out. NTD's Miguel Moreno has more on how this could play out. Jurors have taken a lead role in the Kyle Rittenhouse trial. The defendant, the court, and the country now await the jury's verdict. The Rittenhouse legal team, however, has asked the judge to declare a mistrial with prejudice. If the judge were to do this, he would cancel the trial and Rittenhouse would walk away a free man, free of charges. Wisconsin criminal defense attorney Kirk Everson tells me this is unlikely to happen. Why has the defense asked for a mistrial with prejudice? Well, with prejudice would obviously mean that the prosecution would not be able to rebring the case. Um, the, the, the question as to why they have done it, I'm clearly not on that defense team, um, and I'm, I'm not certain that the judge would grant that because the remedy for violations of the rule of, of evidence is a reversal of a conviction and then a new trial uh, so the defendant would get a, a new trial um, so I, I just i highly doubt that the judge is going to grant um, a mistrial with prejudice in the request rittenhouse's attorneys accuse prosecutors of unjustly giving them a low quality copy of higher quality video evidence the original video which prosecutors consider key evidence was 11.2 megabytes large Prosecutors gave the defense a lower resolution 3.6 megabyte file. Rittenhouse's lawyers also cited two procedural issues made by prosecutor Thomas Binger. I think the remedy uh, under the law for all of those violations, and we're looking unfavorably at the prosecution when I'm talking about this, uh, the remedy is simply a new trial for Mr. Rittenhouse. Concerning the video evidence in question, prosecutors denied any wrongdoing. They say a technical glitch appears to have produced the lower quality video. But the jury has seen the high quality video. Rittenhouse's lawyers refreshed their mistrial request on Wednesday, this time without prejudice. So if the judge grants the request, Rittenhouse can be retried in court. Miguel Moreno, NTD News. The House today voted to censure Republican Congressman Paul Gosar and strip him of his two committee assignments. It was over a video he recently posted on Twitter and Instagram. Top Democrats say the video, which is now deleted, threatened violence against Congresswoman Alexandria Ocasio-Cortez and President Biden. NTD's Melina Weiskup brings us more from Washington, D.C. House Speaker Pelosi says this vote is needed because of the congressman's actions, actions she called an endangerment to the House of Representatives. Gozar posted the video earlier this month, asking any anime fans out there, it's a parody of the opening song of a popular anime series. And it mainly shows border agents and illegal immigrants at the southern border. Near the end, Gosar photoshopped his head onto the hero of the series. The character strikes the neck of a titan, photoshopped into Congresswoman Alexandria Ocasio-Cortez, and takes on another titan, photoshopped into President Biden. Gosar says this is a symbolic portrayal of his fight against the Biden administration's immigration policies. Both the White House and Pelosi have condemned the video. I think they're threatening the lives of anybody, not just a member of Congress, but certainly the President of the United States. Should 
Um, you know, there is absolutely no place uh, for for um, of any kind of any no place for any violence of any sort uh, in this political system. And uh, you know, I, I, I don't want to go any further than that. Uh, I leave it to uh, the social media platform on how they're going to move forward on that. Ocasio-Cortez herself also responded to the video earlier this month, calling it a fantasy video of Gosar killing her. And it is so common for women and women of color to be sounding alarms about very disturbing behaviors, patterns, etc., to almost be whistleblowers within institutions and to not only be ignored, but to have uh, very serious threats not really be addressed. Gossard deleted the video after a call with House Minority Leader Kevin McCarthy, but he has not publicly apologized for it. McCarthy said Gosar didn't see it before it posted. It was not his intent to show any harm. What I said to the conference was, we cannot accept any action or showing of violence to another member. The Arizona Republican defended himself during the House debate on Wednesday. I rise today to address and reject the mischaracterization accusations from many in this body that the cartoon from my office is dangerous or threatening. It was not and I reject the false narrative categorically. I do not espouse violence towards anyone. I never have. It was not my purpose to make anyone upset. I voluntarily took the cartoon down, not because it was itself a threat, but because some thought it was. Gosar sits on two committees, the Committee on Oversight and Reform and the Committee on Natural Resources. Stripping a member of committee assignments and censoring them is a severe punishment in the House, and it would be the first time the House has moved to censor a member since 2010. Reporting in Washington, D.C., Melina Weiskup, NTD News. The two Republicans who voted to censor Gosar are Congresswoman Liz Cheney and Congressman Adam Kinzinger. And the House is on track to pass the second part of President Biden's spending plan this week. Speaker Nancy Pelosi joined Senate leader Chuck Schumer today to show their unified effort to get the next big bill to Biden's desk before Christmas. After the president signed off on a historic infrastructure investment this week, Democrats are moving forward with their next big goal, climate and social welfare. And today they were joined by Congressman Josh Gottheimer, showing that moderates and progressives in the House have reached a deal to get it done. But the full budget report won't be released until late Friday. So the House could actually pass the plan before knowing what the estimated overall costs will be. And a congressional advisory body is warning that China could launch an attack on Taiwan despite risks of U.S. intervention. Its report also details the CCP's threats to the world. The U.S.-China Economic and Security Review Commission, or USCC, on Wednesday released its annual report to Congress. The 539-page document highlights the increasing threats the Chinese Communist Party poses to the U.S. and world order. This year, the CCP showed itself increasingly willing to escalate that competition into confrontation. While the U.S. seeks to preserve interests without conflicts, the Bipartisan Advisory Board warns that Beijing may have different ideas. The Chinese are at, are at or near an initial invasion capability, which means the ability to conduct the land invasion of Taiwan, even assuming American intervention, albeit at very high risk. The report recommends the U.S. should increase deterrence by making it easier for Taiwan to purchase defense articles and deploying crews and ballistic missiles in the Indo-Pacific, while warning that if China perceives a weak U.S. position, it could seek an opportunist invasion. If they can accomplish um, you know, uh, assimilation on their terms with Taiwan, it will undermine America's credibility as a security guarantor uh, in the region. So. The implications for the United States are, are very, very great. Besides increased security threats, the new report also highlights how the opaque nature of Chinese companies can put U.S. investors at risk. They are looking to the U.S. and other Western uh, sources of capital to help fuel CCP policies. In addition to expanding investment restrictions on Chinese companies, the Commission also urges U.S. firms with activities in China to better disclose what they are doing there. Stop saying, I don't want to disclose this. Stop saying, I don't, you know, 
I don't like the light shined on my activities in China because it makes me look bad. Well, you know, guess what? <laughs> If it makes you look bad, maybe you shouldn't be involved in it. The report concludes that the U.S. should design policies based on the realization that the CCP is a menacing adversary determined to end the security and prosperity of billions of people. It warns that otherwise we will continue to see a slow but certain erosion of democratic nations around the world. The drug abuse epidemic in the U.S. is becoming deadlier than ever. According to the latest CDC data, a record number of over 100,000 Americans died of drug overdoses in a single 12-month period. Provisional data published by the CDC on Wednesday estimates that 100,306 people died from drug overdoses in the 12 months ending in April of this year. This is the first time that figure passed the 100,000 mark. Compared to the same period the previous year, the number of deaths rose by 28%. And compared to five years ago, the number of deaths doubled. Synthetic opioids, mostly fentanyl, made up around two-thirds of the deaths. Drug cartels in Mexico often make versions of fentanyl with chemicals from China. Meth and other psychostimulants made up over a quarter of the deaths. Experts say there are two major factors behind the rising death toll. The CCP virus pandemic and the fact that fentanyl use is becoming more widespread. Dr. Nora Volko, director of the National Institute on Drug Abuse, told CNN what we're seeing are the effects of these patterns of crisis and the appearance of more dangerous drugs at much lower prices. Only four states reported death tolls lower than last year's, South Dakota, Delaware, New Jersey and New Hampshire. Drug overdoses in the U.S. are now responsible for a similar number of deaths each year as Alzheimer's disease and diabetes. And overdoses may take even more lives. Robert Anderson from the CDC's National Center for Health Statistics said it's telling us that 2021 looks like it will be worse than 2020. Senator Hawley has introduced a parent's bill of rights to defend the role of parents in education. The bill includes giving parents the right to access the entire contents of their child's curriculum. This comes as parents nationwide are demanding greater transparency from their schools. Republican Senator Josh Hawley is proposing to strengthen the rights of parents in education. Introducing Tuesday, the Parents' Bill of Rights Act. It outlines eight rights parents should have regarding their children's education. And if these rights are violated by federally funded schools, the bill would enable parents to sue. Among the eight rights include the right for parents to know what exactly their child is being taught in school and who is teaching them. This right could be especially crucial since at present, parents usually aren't able to obtain copies of a curriculum if it's copyrighted. The bill would also require schools to disclose information to parents about outside groups receiving school contracts and funding. In addition, it states school board meetings about curricula and other student issues must be held in public and allow for public comments. Hawley said in a press release that America is seeing a concerted effort by the left to shut parents out. He pointed to the Justice Department's involvement in investigating alleged threats from parents against school boards, and activists funded by dark money who seek to quietly introduce critical race theory into school curricula. Hawley said it's time to give control back to parents, not woke bureaucrats, and empower them to start a new era of openness in education. A leaked internal document indicates that the FBI may be using counterterrorism tools to track down certain parents, those who allegedly threaten school board members. This calls some recent testimony into question, as a top Biden administration official had said the DOJ was not targeting parents. House Judiciary GOP released a new whistleblower document Tuesday making public an internal email sent by a member of the FBI's Inspection Division. The document discloses that the agency's Counterterrorism and Criminal Divisions Department created a threat tag called EDU Officials to track instances of related threats. Addressing its internal departments, the FBI's email reads, We ask that your offices apply the threat tag to investigations and assessments of threats specifically directed against school board administrators, board members, teachers, and staff. The revelation comes after the National School Boards Association likened some alleged threats from parents to domestic terrorism. Over the last several months, school board meetings have gotten especially heated over the issues of masking policies and critical race theory curricular. Attorney General Merrick Garland issued a memorandum on October 4th directing the FBI to investigate the alleged threats. 
Citing the leaked document, Congressman Jim Jordan wrote a letter to Garland on Tuesday. It accused him of lying to Congress when he testified last month that DOJ isn't targeting parents who choose to protest at school board meetings. Senator Josh Hawley also called on Garland to return to Capitol Hill and answer for the allegations. He tweeted, if this is accurate, parents are getting the domestic terrorist treatment after all. The FBI has denied the accusation in a statement to the Epic Times, saying it has never been in the business of investigating parents who speak out or policing speech at school board meetings. The Occupational Safety and Health Administration, or OSHA, stopped enforcing President Biden's vaccine mandate for larger companies after an appeals court ruling. NTD spoke to a Republican congressman who says the mandate is unconstitutional. OSHA, the health and safety arm of the Department of Labor, had been tasked with enforcing the rule to have all Americans who work at companies with 100 or more employees vaccinated or undergo weekly testing and wear a mask. The rule sparked dozens of lawsuits. Congress never gave OSHA that authority. It was never even thought of in Congress to give OSHA that authority. For Joe Biden and for his lawyers and attorneys in the White House and staffers to sit there and try to construe some way for him to get his way is outrageous. On November 12th, the Fifth Circuit Court of Appeals reaffirmed its decision to put vaccine mandate enforcement on hold. The court stated that the mandate was staggeringly overbroad and ordered OSHA to take no steps to implement or enforce the mandate until further court order. Florida Congressman Byron Donalds told NTD that President Biden knows that the mandate is unconstitutional. He already said before he doesn't have the legal authority to do it, but he's doing it anyway because he's literally trying to scare businesses with the force of law and scare people with the force of law to do what they have not chosen to do in their ordinary lives. That is dictatorial. That is totalitarian. That the Sixth Circuit Court of Appeals will hear a consolidation of legal challenges to President Biden's vaccine mandate. And we have some tips from the TSA that may help make your Thanksgiving go a little more smoothly. Travelers are advised to r arrive a little earlier to airports and use pre-check if possible. NTD's Kevin Hogan has more on the recommendations and how to travel with food if you're wanting to share it with your family. The Transportation Security Administration, or TSA, can't help with traffic on the road, but they want to help streamline your travel experience at the airport. They recommend breezing through security using pre-check and waiting until you arrive at your destination before you wrap gifts. That's because some gifts may need additional inspection and guards may not have time to re-wrap them because check-in lines are expected to be packed. Now we expect to see substantial increase in passenger volumes which will be approaching the pre-pandemic 2019 periods of, of volume that we saw from two years ago which is good news for the airport, good news for the region. But what about traveling with food? The rule is anything solid can go through the checkpoint, including pies, cakes, and even frozen turkeys. But anything spillable that's more than 3.4 ounces should be in a checked bag. The airlines have a rule that any liquids carried onto the plane must be 3.4 ounces or less. No exceptions, except for hand sanitizer. Uh, you can bring um, up to one 12 ounce container of hand sanitizer, like you said. Uh, typically, the limit is 3.4 ounces, which is 100 milliliters, which is the international standard. And so usually, you'd have to put your, your liquids, gels, and aerosols in a bag like this. But because there's a pandemic, we're allowing people to bring up to one 12-ounce container of hand sanitizer. The TSA also reminds travelers to wear a mask, not bring prohibited items, and ask for help for people with disabilities ahead of time. Happy travels. Kevin Hogan, NTD News, New York. Up next, two former players for the New York Knicks joined a turkey giveaway. They tell us why they think it's important to help people in need. And animal lanterns light up the annual holiday lights at the Bronx Zoo. We get a sneak peek preview of the event. That and more on NTD News. Several New York icons got together today to host a food giveaway. They had a whole turkey for anyone showing up. NTD's Arian Pazdar was there. 
former NBA players, businessman John Katzmatidis and many more gathered here today to start their food giveaway. They say they're handing out 100,000 turkeys to families in need. This is the start of the season of giving, and it's so important for all of us to come together and give. The organizers lined up and handed out turkeys one by one. John Wallace played for the New York Knicks and was a first-round pick in the NBA draft back in the 90s. He says he's doing this because he knows what it's like being poor. You know, when I was younger, we kind of lived that way, so I remember those days vividly, and it was very tough. It puts a lot of stress. Um, we, were over to, we were able to overcome it in my household because of all the love that was there. So even when we were struggling and there wasn't money, we had a lot of love and love overcomes all. Tom Hoover, also a former player, agrees that love should be shared. You can help your fellow man. That's what you're supposed to be doing in this life. Uh, how many pair of shoes can you wear at one time? How many cars can you drive? So if you're fortunate enough to have uh, two pairs of shoes or 25 cents over your lunch money, then yes, you can give a dime or a nickel to somebody else to help them. A line of people formed outside the church. Once inside, they got their free turkey and beans and other side dishes to serve with the turkey. The main organizer is John Katz Matidis. He owns the grocery store chain Gristidis. We have to make sure no child goes hungry in New York, nobody is poor goes hungry in New York. Let's, it's the holidays, it's time to give. The organizers said they will continue giving away free turkeys in years to come. Ariane Pastar, NTD News, New York. The Blue Man Group is turning 30 today. They celebrated their anniversary at the Empire State Building, and NTD was there. <laughs> the three blue men were posing at the Empire State Building Observatory on Wednesday morning. The band held their very first performance in Manhattan on November 17, 1991. They've come a long way since then and have performed all over the U.S. and around the world. They often like to throw marshmallows, other sweets, or even buckets of paint into the crowd. Their visit to the Empire State Building, however, was more laid back. They made funny faces and posed under a sign with a Halloween motif. Some of their performances have the theme of climbing onto rooftops, so there's probably no better place for their celebration than New York's Empire State Building. The holiday season is coming, and in one New York borough, even the animals are lighting up. Let's get a preview of the Bronx Zoo holiday lights display. NTD's Chenny Wu was there. The holiday is brightening up. I'm here at the annual holiday lights show at the Bronx Zoo. At the opening ceremony, a lights show. Then a performance including wildlife stilt walkers. Three, two, one. Zoo officials and VIPs flipped the switch and officially kicked off the zoo's holiday festivities. Well, after a long hiatus, Holiday Lights is back after a second year. Last year we had a great event. We're back this year bigger and better than ever. This year's lights feature six animal lantern trails. In all, you'll see more than 260 lanterns representing 70 animals and plant species. The lanterns are beautiful. But in addition, we hope they inspire you to really feel closer to animals and nature. I think my favorite thing so far has been the lantern trail um, because in the past we haven't been able to see them. They've been too crowded. But this year they've spread them out and it's beautiful, right, sweetie? Do yes. You, do you have a favorite animal? Elephants. The elephants? The lights and all the animation on the animatronics have been beautiful. I, I like the holiday lights because it's so colorful. Other attractions around the zoo include wildlife theater performances, food stalls, and even a s'mores station. The Bronx Zoo Holiday Lights will be open to the public from Friday until January 9th. Tickets must be purchased in advance and are expected to sell out. Chenny Wu, NTD News, New York. Cryptocurrency is sending shockwaves across the sports industry. In a record-setting deal, one crypto firm is buying the naming rights to the famous Staples Center, home of the Los Angeles Lakers. NTD's Phil Zoe reports. The Staples Center, where the Los Angeles Lakers, Clippers, Kings and Sparks call home, is getting a new name. If this was 2017, it would feel surreal. It means that Bitcoin is showing its resilience and it's here to stay. 
On Christmas Day, the center will be renamed the Crypto.com Arena. I mean, this is the Staples Center. It's the largest naming rights deal in the history of major sports. Cryptocurrency exchange Crypto.com based in Singapore reportedly paid $700 million for the naming rights. I don't think this is even a debate whether crypto will or will not go mainstream. It's at the point of how mainstream will it get and can it actually eat the world. Co-founder Chris Klein at Bitcoin IRA says crypto will become just like the internet and email. It won't be long before cryptocurrency embeds itself into the fabric of our daily lives. But some skeptics are not convinced. So a lot of these companies have come from nowhere and suddenly they're big because there's a crypto boom in 2021. The comparison everyone's making is Enron Fields. Crypto journalist David Gerard says Enron also bought the naming rights to a Houston stadium back in 2000 before going bankrupt just two years later. It's very splashy advertising. It doesn't mean that crypto is more solid. A company that's suddenly flush with money, spending some money to try to make themselves look bigger. Earlier this year, a Bahamas-based crypto exchange also bought the naming rights to the Miami Heat Stadium for over $100 million, renaming it the FTX Arena. Crypto.com's coin went up as much as 50% today, from an average of 40 cents to as high as 60 cents, before falling back down halfway. Phil Zhou, NTD News. Coming up, an area of land in California is being preserved as protected open space in agriculture. Locals agree on protecting the area, but current landowners say the city needs to compensate them for devaluing their land. Rampant shoplifting targeting two jewelry stores in California, one in San Francisco's Chinatown and another in an indoor mall. That and more on NTD News. Secure, the true solution for your digital privacy and security. Secure is a private and secure messaging and email solution hosted in Switzerland using military-grade encryption and Swiss privacy laws, giving you true privacy. Secure is 100% private and does not collect or sell any of your personal data. Secure's Helix technology connects you securely to our Swiss servers without the need of a VPN, guaranteeing privacy and security for all your communications. Secure Messenger doesn't require your phone number or any personal data that hackers target. Chat by Invites allows you to chat privately and securely with anyone outside of your secure network without the need for others to download Secure. Secure Send offers you a private and secure way to email anyone outside of Secure. You won't find this level of privacy or security on any other email or instant messaging application. Visit secure.com. Regain and protect your privacy today. 90% of news outlets in the United States are controlled by six corporations. They're not out to tell you the truth of what's happening. They're out to tell you the picture of the world that they represent. The mission of the Epic Times is to chase the truth to ground all statements and facts, and prevent people from being misled. This is a battle, a battle between truth and deceit. Subscribe today and join the Americans who are seeking truth and tradition. We'd love to have you on board. When you look at TV networks in America, a soundbite and fighted out culture prevails on news and commentary programs. As a Canadian, I'm fascinated with America, and I wanted to offer American thought leaders an opportunity to share their thoughts in a deep dive format where we can explore their ideas together. And so American Thought Leaders was born. The world's most brilliant thinkers believed that open discourse was the key to greatness. However, all around the world, we see that discourse is being stifled and political agendas have subverted media. The Epoch Times launched its Global Thought Leaders program to bring back this great tradition of free thought. As the host of American Thought Leaders, every week I interview some of the most intriguing minds on the most pressing issues of our time. Be 
sure to check out our new episodes every week. California city of San Jose passed a resolution to turn land originally intended for industrial use into protected open space and agriculture. However, the debate surrounding the land lies not with how to use it, but how it's being preserved. NTD's Cynthia Kai has the details. Let's vote. Jimenez? Aye. Perales? Yes. San Jose, California's City Council voted unanimously on November 17th to rezone land in the city's North Coyote Valley area. 314 acres will now be protected for open space and agriculture. The 314 acres you talked about is privately owned land here. This is where the warehouse would go. Over here, which is Gavilan College and then a tiny little piece here. That's all that's left of, that's not been already protected for the public. Mackenzie says the council vote was the next step in preserving the land. This land can now transition into protected open space, uh, farmland, wildlife habitat, places to protect our water supply. The move means the potential development of two warehouses, each planned to span the length of more than six football fields, will not replace existing farmland. However, city officials agree that current landowners should be fairly compensated for their land. Former San Jose Mayor Chuck Reed, now a lawyer representing property owners, says rezoning is a temporary solution. The city needs to buy the land or control the development rights for a permanent vision. Yes, that's correct. There was not much debate about whether or not the land should be preserved or protected. The debate really was about how the city will compensate the landowners. And I think the direction, the motion that was approved, it was a positive step uh, that will be helpful to landowners to getting fair compensation. Reed says whether or not litigation is expected depends on the city council's next moves. I do think that the direction given by the city council and the motion that was approved unanimously makes it clear that the council agrees that the landowners ought to be fairly compensated for their property. So I'm hopeful that we can work out a resolution that will be satisfactory to the landowners and satisfactory to the city. Moving forward, city council members say they will consider the costs of purchasing the land for a more permanent preservation solution. Cynthia Kai, NTD News, California. On Tuesday, thieves broke into a jewelry store in San Francisco's Chinatown. On Monday, another group of robbers broke into a jewelry store in a mall. Both got away with the goods before police could arrive. Here's more with NTD's Eileen Ang. On Tuesday morning, thieves broke into a Chinatown jewelry store in San Francisco and made off with thousands of dollars in jewelry. The owners of Longboat Jewelers told Cron4 News the thieves cut the lock on the store's gate, hammered down the front door, and stole more than $250,000 in merchandise. The owners were months away from retiring after 40 years. The San Francisco Police Department informed NTD via email that officers responded to the burglary at 4.23 a.m. and found the multiple glass cases were damaged and store inventory stolen. They will continue to process the scene for evidence. Last Friday, the same store reported a vandalism incident where the front glass window was damaged, but nothing was stolen. In nearby Concord, California, the police department released a surveillance video where people can be seen going into a jewelry store with hammers, smashing the display glass and taking the jewelry. At around 7.30 p.m. Monday, nine people robbed the Iceberg Diamonds jewelry store inside Sun Valley Mall. According to the police report, employees tried to intervene and were kept back by the hammer-wielding criminals. The suspects got away before police arrived. Some mall customers reported hearing gunshots, but it was the sounds of hammers breaking glass. No shots were fired. In an emailed statement to NTD, a Concord police spokesperson said, We are not yet certain on the exact dollar amount loss, but it is safe to say it would be a number above what the state considers grand theft. The case is still under investigation. This is not the first brazen group robbery in the Bay Area. In June, a coordinated group of shoplifters ran into a Louis Vuitton store at Stanford Shopping Center in Palo Alto. They got away in five different cars with more than $100,000 in designer handbags. 
In July, 10 suspects took 43 handbags valued around $150,000 from Neiman Marcus in San Francisco. They fled in three getaway cars. Rampant shoplifting in San Francisco has forced many stores to close or reduce hours. Eileen Ang, NTD News, California. Entrepreneurs on the West Coast today discussed several ways to invest for small business owners. The speakers talked about ways of raising money for one's own business enterprises. NTD's David Lamp reports. Property in California are known for its high prices among the rest of the nation. Now some local entrepreneurs are saying if you have the drive, there are options to make it possible to invest. Speakers from the African American community talked about the importance of capital and how to make it in today's economy. They also suggested raising capital by both taking loans and crowdfunding. I mentioned crowdfunding earlier um, and I'll say it again because that is a way to raise capital and to test your market and see who your followers and your um, customer base. Jay has her own fashion store in Oakland and recommends taking advantage of e-commerce when starting out. Others also encourage purchasing commercial space or residential property for income and getting loans for it. I would just say as long as you are making a profit and your business is not suffering a loss. That means when we look at your previous tax returns, we see that you're not operating in the red. Barnes says in order to look favorable to banks, it's a good idea to have tenants signed up. If you come across a building that's empty, that is empty and you really want to purchase it, <laughs> you may want to work with somebody. Uh, you may want to work with somebody to get them in as a tenant. He also encouraged syndication, telling potential investors to pool their money together. David Lamb, NTD News, California. Coming up, an alleged scandal in China. International athletes back a Chinese tennis star. She accused a former top leader in the communist regime of sexual assault. And Amazon plans to stop accepting Visa credit cards issued in the UK. It's part of a years-long standoff between the companies. We'll tell you what it means for merchants and more in just a moment. International athletes are speaking out over an alleged scandal and putting Beijing in the hot seat. They're backing a Chinese tennis star who's accusing a former Chinese vice premier of sexual assault. NTD's Tiffany Meyer has the story. International athletes are speaking out. Tennis superstar Naomi Osaka is the latest athlete to voice concern over Peng Shuai. The former Chinese tennis star has not been seen in public since accusing a former Chinese state leader of sexual assault. Osaka said on Twitter Tuesday, censorship is never okay at any cost. I hope Peng Shuai and her family are safe and okay. I am in shock of the current situation and I am sending love and light her way. Pong once ranked world number one in doubles. Earlier this month, she accused former Chinese vice premier Zhang Gaoli of coercing her into sex at his home three years ago. Her post on China's Twitter-like platform Weibo was up for just 30 minutes before Chinese censors deleted it. Her Weibo account has been blocked and any mention of the accusation online has been wiped. Pong has not been seen in public since then for half a month. A growing number of international athletes have expressed concern, including men's world number one Novak Djokovic. It's honestly it's shocking, you know, that, that she's missing. Tennis legend and 39-time Grand Slam championship winner Billie Jean King, former world number one Chris Evert, and former top-ranking Martina Navratilova also expressed their concern. In addition, three tennis associations spoke out for Pong. The Women's Tennis Association called on Beijing to investigate Pong's allegations, saying she should be heard, not censored. Later, the association was joined by the ATP Tour, a worldwide top-tier tennis tour for men, as well as the U.S. Tennis Association. On Wednesday, a Chinese Communist Party's media mouthpiece said they saw an email from Pong to the Women's Tennis Association. In it, they said Pong denied she had disappeared. NTD contacted the association for comment but did not receive a response before airtime. The accused Zhang Gaoli is 75. He served in the Communist Party's highest leadership body, the Politburo Standing Committee. He retired as vice premier three years ago. The U.S. and Japan today announced a new trade partnership on labor, environment and digital trade issues. 
The announcement comes a day after President Biden met virtually with Chinese Communist Party leader Xi Jinping. At Wednesday's meeting in Tokyo, U.S. Trade Representative Catherine Tai met with Japanese government ministers. Japanese Foreign Minister Yoshimasa Hayashi said the aim of the talks was to further deepen the Japan-U.S. alliance. The initial meetings of the new trade partnership would take place early next year, with periodic meetings on a regular basis. That's according to a statement from Tai. The new talks will address concerns over U.S. Section 232 national security tariffs on steel and aluminum and curbing global excess capacity for the metals driven largely by China. The talks follow a U.S. quota deal with the European Union to allow around 4 million tons of EU-produced steel duty-free into the United States annually. And as Chinese developer Evergrande scrambles to meet its debt obligations, its founder reportedly deals with the problem by selling luxury assets, including art, calligraphy and three high-end homes. Here's more. Ailing Chinese property developer Evergrande faces a battle to pay its debts. With around $300 billion in liabilities, it's been lurching from one deadline to another, often paying at the last minute. Now it looks like that's taking a very personal toll on Chairman Hui Kaiyan. He's reportedly been selling off luxury assets to help pay the debts. Filings at Hong Kong's land registry show he's pledged three luxury homes in the city to investors. Real estate agents say each is worth over $100 million. Then there are his aircraft. A Reuters source says Hui has sold two Gulfstream jets in recent weeks. Media reports say he also owns a private Airbus and a 60-metre yacht, but there is no word on their fate. Less obvious assets are also up for grabs. The source says the billionaire has also been selling some of his art and calligraphy collection. Hui rose from humble origins in a Chinese village. Four years ago, his net worth was estimated at $45 billion, but it's now thought to be down to around $11 billion. Chinese authorities have told him to use some or all of his wealth to help Evergrande honour its debts. There has been no word from him or the company on any of the reported sales. Hui is also a big collector of valuable koi carp, a traditional symbol of good fortune in Chinese culture. Right now, though, his fortune, in every sense, seems to be running short. Bad news if you're using a Visa card in the UK. Amazon says it will stop accepting UK-issued Visa credit cards starting next year. The giant has been complaining that some credit card fees are too high. This is not the first incident either. NTD's Evelyn Lee has more. Amazon says it will stop accepting Visa credit cards from the UK starting January 19th next year. The e-commerce giant had a years-long battle with Visa because of its high fees. Um, this is not new. Um, Amazon, a couple months ago, decided not to accept Visa cards also in Canada. And this is probably part of a, an ongoing tactic to renegotiate fees. Amazon says high fees are a major obstacle for businesses. Because of them, they're not able to provide the best prices for customers. But Katri says it's rare that these fees are passed on to consumers. Rob Keeve, the CEO of a cross-border e-commerce solutions company, has a similar stance. Many merchants, certainly on the e-com side, don't pass on the fees. They simply eat it. Visa says it was disappointed that Amazon is threatening to restrict consumer choice in the future, but they're still working toward a resolution. The move reportedly could be a way for Amazon to get bargaining power over Visa. But both Katri and Keefe say merchants probably aren't too excited about this news. I think if our merchants were here talking to you, I think they would say it's painful having high fees on some payment methods, but would rather have the sale than not. And it could be that our margin is a percent lower on those transactions. But losing a transaction is a 99% loss, not a 1% loss. This is an ongoing fight. Kroger and Walmart also had similar standoffs with Visa before reaching private settlements. Now Amazon offers some customers affected by the move $27 off their purchase. The company hopes this encourages them to update their payment methods. Evelyn Lee, NTD News. And official figures show inflation in October was over 4% in the UK, more than double the Bank of England's target and the highest in nearly 10 years. 
The sharp rise was driven by soaring energy and fuel prices. Many forecasters are expecting the bank will raise interest rates next month. NTD's Earl Rhodes has the story. The Office for National Statistics, or the ONS, said inflation rose to 4.2 percent in October, the biggest jump since December 2011. The latest rate is bigger than expected and more than double the Bank of England's target of 2 percent. In September, the rate of consumer prices index inflation was 3.1 percent. The ONS said the sharp rise was driven in part by soaring energy and fuel prices. Official data showed that despite the government's energy price cap, electricity bills in October were nearly 20% higher than last year and gas bills were nearly 30% higher. The ONS said average petrol prices hit their highest since September 2012 at nearly 140 pence a litre, over 25 pence more expensive than last October. Because of a global semiconductor chip shortage, used car prices were pushed higher. The prices of second-hand cars are nearly now 30% higher than in April. Most economists expect interest rates will rise to a quarter of a percent in December, as last month's bigger-than-expected leap in the cost of living is putting more pressure on the Bank of England to rein in inflation. The bank warned earlier this month it may have to increase rates in the coming months, as it forecast inflation peaking at 5% next April. Earl Rhodes, NTD News. The World Health Organization's head of emergencies program, Mike Ryan, has warned governments against making vaccines compulsory. He called some measures targeting unvaccinated people extreme and said they raise real issues around freedoms and human rights. Mandatory vaccination for work or mandatory vaccination or proof of uh, previous infection to access hotels, restaurants, uh, and even to the extreme of asking people who are unvaccinated to stay home as opposed to vaccinated people being out. And this raises real issues around civil liberties. This raises real issues uh, around uh, human rights. Uh, and it's something that governments should consider extremely carefully. Ryan said that if such measures are brought in, there should be clear reasons stated and demonstrated as to why that action is being taken. And governments need to be absolutely sure the benefits outweigh the risks. He noted the WHO's position on compulsory vaccination, stating it's not the best means to achieve the highest vaccine uptake. Austria becomes the first European country to reinstate restrictions on daily movements as police and citizens get used to, used to life in different type of lockdown. Unvaccinated people are only allowed to leave home for work and essential shopping. People are checked by police as they go in and out of shops to make sure they've received their jabs, with authorities saying they've received little pushback against the measures so far. NTD's Eddie Aitken brings us this report. Police in Vienna are carrying out spot checks of COVID vaccination status after a national lockdown of unvaccinated people began on Monday. We try to control closely, but you have to understand that it's still random checks. Of course, you can never enforce a law in such a way that everyone is checked everywhere and all the time. Police say they are encountering little kickback against the measures. I think it's quite good that there are checks because as a mum with a one-year-old daughter, I'm honestly concerned about her. I myself am vaccinated, but my daughter is unprotected. I think it is absolutely fine that there are checks and that vaccinated people like me can all move around freely. Others felt their freedoms were tinged somewhat by the measures. I expected it. Not to such an extent, checking on the way in and then on the way out too, but it's part of the measures. I find it a bit weird. That's all I can say about it, really. I'm vaccinated. It doesn't affect me that way. But to have so many police standing in front of shops, I think it's kind of weird. Two million people in the country of nine million are forced to stay at home and only allowed to go out for work or food shopping or to go get vaccinated. Officials say police patrols and checks will be stepped up and unvaccinated people can be fined up to £1,200 if they violate these rules. 
the country's third biggest party in parliament, is planning a protest against COVID restrictions on Saturday. Eddie Aitken, NTD News. An exhibition dedicated to a historian and museum curator has opened in Kiev, Ukraine. It celebrates the man who gave his life for art. He fought for the preservation of Ukraine's cultural values during Soviet rule. For this, he was repressed and eventually killed. Here's more. This is only a small portion of the artworks and artifacts that can be seen in Ukrainian museums today, thanks to Fedir Ernst. During the Soviet Union, this man managed to return and preserve many cultural objects that the Bolsheviks exported from Ukraine. The fact that we still have objects that we can't see in museums, archival documents, is all thanks to him. Otherwise, they could just rob, take items abroad, and blow up temples. A thematic exhibition was opened in honor of Ernst at the National Museum of the History of Ukraine. During his time here, the museum's collection was replenished with more than 5,000 items. Among the preserved artifacts are Taras Shevchenko's paintings, which were returned from Russia, and objects from the Mizagiria Fayance factory, one of the first factories in Ukraine. This, for example, is an ancient portrait of a Ukrainian hetman, Below is a magazine which described all the returned valuables. Next to the cover is written that the portrait of Hetman Ivan Sporopaski without a frame was returned. In his attempt to save the cultural objects of Ukraine, Ernst led many expeditions and archaeological excavations. For this, he was persecuted by the Soviet authorities. He was repeatedly arrested on charges of counter-revolutionary activities. In 1941, he was arrested again. He was shot dead in October 1942 as an alleged German spy. He was rehabilitated in the 15th year. The exhibition will run until March 9th next year. Coming up, your friendly neighborhood Spider-Man is back with more adventures. We'll take a look at the new trailer for Spider-Man No Way Home. And a motorcycle star performs a breathtaking stunt after launching help himself from a cliff in the French Alps. It's a first time ever performance. This and more here on NTD News. Hello, I'm Mike Lindell, and I'm here to tell you about my new product from my pillow towels that actually work. Watch this absorbency test. Here's another towel that we randomly went out and bought. Here's one of my towels with the nice design. I don't know if you can see this, but you could line a swimming pool with this. This is crazy. Get rid of it. Towels that actually work. The new MyPillow towels are exclusively made with 100% USA combed cotton. With proprietary technology and with maximum absorbency, they dry you faster and are guaranteed to work. I'm interrupting this commercial right now. Retailers have canceled MyPillow. And to thank you for all your support, I'm going to pass the savings directly on to you. Go to MyPillow.com to get deep discounts on all MyPillow products. For example, you get my dog beds for as low as $19.99 or for a limited time, you can get my six-piece towel sets, regularly $109.99, now only $39.99, the lowest price ever with your promo code. Finally, we'll take a look at the new Spider-Man No Way Home trailer, released Tuesday by Sony Pictures and Marvel Studios. In the upcoming film, Tom Holland's Peter Parker has his hands full trying to save everyone. In the trailer, Spider-Man battles with scores of past villains, from Alfred Molina's Otto Octavius to Willem Dafoe's Green Goblin, while dealing with the fallout from his true identity being unmasked at the end of 2019's Spider-Man Far From Home. You're not Peter Parker. Parker enlists the help of Benedict Cumberbatch's Doctor Strange to restore his secret identity with a spell that backfires and opens up the multiverse unleashing hell. They all die fighting Spider-Man. It's their fate. Parker still has love interest MJ, played by Zendaya, and trusted pal Ned Leeds, played by Jacob Batalon, by his side as he faces his greatest challenge yet. Spider-Man No Way Home will hit theaters on December 17th.
and a French motorcycling star performs a breathtaking leap in the Alps today in preparation for a World Cup circuit. Let's watch the footage. An 108-foot leap into the horizon. Then a shout. Woo! French freestyle motocross star Tom Pages launched off a 558-foot cliff, doing a double front flip before deploying a parachute and gliding down a French gorge in Avories. A world-first performance that combines freestyle motocross and parachuting, Pages said he had to train a lot for this. I was petrified by the idea, but I couldn't help imagining what it would be like jumping on a motorcycle. After successfully completing two complete front flips, Pages released a specially designed parachute and glided to safety over the picturesque ravine. He said the hardest thing to manage for the leap was the wind. Pages has five X Games gold medals, two silvers and a bronze, and will probably continue to seek out more stomach sinking stunts. Experiencing things like that, it's the ultimate dream, the ultimate rush. Winter sports athletes are busy getting in their final preparations for their respective disciplines around the FIS World Cup circuit. And that's all for today's news. Thanks for tuning in. I'm Stephanie Cox. Thanks for watching us on YouTube. Did you know YouTube only keeps selective videos on its platform? So if you want to make sure you get the full picture, just subscribe to our newsletter. Go to newsletter.ntd.com and sign up. It's free.